The legend of Shambhala is said to date back thousands of years, and references to the mythical land can be found in various ancient texts. The Bond scriptures speak of a closely related land where peace and joy are the fabric of being. Hindu texts such as the Vishnu Purana mention Shambhala as the birthplace of Kalki, the final incarnation of Vishnu, who will usher in a new era. However, the text in which Shambhala is most extensively discussed is the Kala Chakra, where it is said that only those who are karmically worthy may enter. The 14th Dalai Lama noted during the 1985 Kala Chakra initiation that, quote, we can only say that it is a pure land, a pure land in the human realm, and unless one has the merit and the actual karmic association, one cannot actually arrive there. Shambhala, or Shangri-La, is said to be the land of a thousand names. It has been called the Forbidden Land, the Land of White Waters, Land of Radiant Spirits, Land of Living Fire, Land of the Living Gods, and Land of Wonders. While it appears in Buddhist legends, the myth predates Buddhism and was known to the Chinese as Si Tian, the Western Paradise of Si Wang Mu, and to the Russian Old Believers, it is known as the Kingdom of Epona. Old Believers refers to Eastern Orthodox Christians that maintain ritual practices as they were before the year 1666. I'll cover them in a future video. That said, in Sanskrit, the word Shambhala means place of tranquility, silence, or happiness, and later by the Tibetans, translated to the happy lands. It is also mentioned in the ancient text of the Zangzung culture, which predated Tibetan Buddhism in Western Tibet. Over many centuries, Numerous explorers and seekers of spiritual wisdom have embarked on expeditions and quests in search of the mythical paradise of Shambhala, and while many have claimed to have been there, no one yet has provided any public evidence of its existence or been able to pinpoint its physical location on a map. However, most references place it somewhere in the mountain regions of Eurasia. The founder of the Theosophical Society, Madame Helena Blavatsky, claimed to have been in touch with a Himalayan occult brotherhood that passed on some of these legends to her. Shambhala is said to have been ruled over by a king or benevolent monarch who, according to prophecy, will emerge to usher in a golden age when the world declines into war and greed and all is lost. According to some, he will be accompanied by a large army, presumably living inside the mountains or inner earth, and vanquish the corrupt world rulers. As with many concepts in the Vajrayana Buddhism, the idea of Shambhala is said to have an outer, inner, and secret meaning. The inner and secret meaning refers to more subtle understandings that represent spiritual attainments and are generally passed on orally. The outer meaning understands Shambhala to exist as a physical place. There are various ideas about where the society is located, but it's often placed in Central Asia, north of Tibet. Tala Pargada Subaro was a student of Blavatsky's from a Hindu background who in 1882 published an article personally addressed to Helena Blavatsky, where he says, quote, The real esoteric doctrine, as well as the mystic allegorical philosophy of the Vedas, were derived, perchance, from the divine inhabitant gods of the sacred island which, as you say, once existed in the sea that covered in those days of old the sandy tract now called Gobi Desert. However that may be, the knowledge of the occult powers of nature possessed by the inhabitants of the lost Atlantis, was learnt by the ancient adepts of India and was appended by them to the esoteric doctrine taught by the residents of the sacred island. 
Madame Blavatsky claimed that ancient Aryans inhabited parts of Asia in antiquity, and nearly a century after her death, tall, blonde-haired mummies started turning up in the deserts of China, dating back 4,000 years, centuries before any East Asian people inhabited the area. While the Chinese communist government tries to downplay these ancient Aryan mummies with Caucasian features, they also do their best to hide the numerous pyramids which litter the Chinese landscape by planting rows of trees on them in an effort to make them less visible from above. They can still be made out, however, using Google Earth, aligned exactly as the pyramids of Egypt are, with the familiar top point missing. Blavatsky claimed that much of their ancient sacred knowledge survived hidden as symbols in many modern religions, but is misunderstood by the majority of the public. Shambhala's location and nature remains a subject of much dispute, and several traditions have arisen as to where it is, including those that emphasize it as a non-physical realm that one can approach only through the mind. While Mongolians identify Shambhala with certain valleys of southern Siberia, Blavatsky herself alluded to a physical location closer to the Himalayas, possibly as a mountainous entrance to an inhabited inner earth kingdom known to some as Agartha. Whether this inner kingdom exists or not, she also maintained that on the surface there was once a sea where the Gobi Desert is, which also had an inhabited island. I find it interesting that there's considerable evidence that in remote antiquity, many parts of the earth that are now desert were once very lush or even submerged below large bodies of water. That said, in response to the publication by Mr. Subaro, which I read earlier, Helena Blavatsky wrote the following in regards to the legend and its origins. Quote, to ascertain such disputed questions, one has to look into and study well the Chinese sacred and historical records, a people whose era begins nearly 4,600 years back, a people so accurate and by whom some of the most important inventions of modern Europe and its so much boasted modern science were anticipated, such as the compass, gunpowder, porcelain, paper, printing, etc., known and practiced thousands of years before these were rediscovered by the Europeans, ought to receive some trust for their records. And from the Lao Tse down to Hyun Tsang, their literature is filled with allusions and references to that island and the wisdom of the Himalayan adepts. In a katana of Buddhist scriptures, from the Chinese by Reverend Samuel Bile, there's a chapter on the Tian Tai school of Buddhism, which our opponents ought to read. Translating the rules of that most celebrated and holy school and sect in China founded by Qin Che Ke, called the Che Che, the wise one, in the year 575 of our era, when coming to the sentence which reads, quote, that which relates to the one garment worn by the great teachers of the snowy mountains. The European translator places after the last sentence a sign of interrogation, as well he may. The statistics of the school of the Hemavatas, or of our Himalayan Brotherhood, are not to be found in the general census records of India. Further, Mr. Beale translates a rule relating to the great professors of the higher order who live in the mountain depths remote from men, the Aranyakas, or hermits. So, with respect to the traditions concerning this island, and apart from the historical records of this preserved in the Chinese and Tibetan sacred books, the legend is alive to this day among the people of Tibet. The fair island is no more, but the country where it once bloomed remains there still, and the spot is well known to some of the great teachers of the snowy mountains, however much convulsed and changed its topography by the awful cataclysm. Every seventh year, these teachers are believed to assemble in Shambhala, the happy land, 
According to the general belief, it is situated in the northwest of Tibet. Some place it within the unexplored central regions, inaccessible even to the fearless nomadic tribes. Others hem it in between the range of the Gangisri Mountains and the northern edge of the Gobi Desert, south and north, and the more populated regions of Kunduz and Kashmir, of the Gaya Peling, and China, west and east, which afford to the curious mind a pretty large latitude to locate it in. Others still place it between Namur Nor and the Quen Lun Mountains, but one and all firmly believe in Shambhala and speak of it as a fertile, fairy-like land, once an island, now an oasis of incomparable beauty, the place of meeting of the inheritors of the esoteric wisdom of the godlike inhabitants of the legendary island. In connection with the archaic legend of the Asian Sea and Atlantic continent, is it not profitable to note a fact known to all modern geologists that the Himalayan slopes afford geological proof that the substance of those lofty peaks was once part of an ocean floor? While many disregard Shambhala as the fanciful subject of myth and legend, for others, a belief in Shambhala stirs an inner yearning to one day find this utopian kingdom. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please leave a comment below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.